I'm going to show you exactly what cameras, lenses and other gear the best landscape astrophotographers in the world are using right now. I went through all the photos from the Milky Way Photographer of the Year awards in the last two years to find out what they're using to create amazing images like this. What might surprise you is that they're not necessarily using the most expensive, highest spec options. So if you want to take photos like this, then watch on and see what your options are. If you want all the data sent straight to your inbox, link below or else watch on. So straight up, there's no best camera for astrophotography, um, but there are certain traits that make cameras well suited to certain types of astrophotography, like in this case, landscape astrophotography or nightscapes. Firstly, everybody uses Sony, Canon or Nikon cameras. You can see a breakdown here of how this is split. But essentially, there are a lot of great cameras from these three brands. Nobody uses Pentax or Fuji cameras or anything like that. Someone always pipes up in the comments about how great their, their Pentax is, but I never see the photos. The majority are using mirrorless cameras versus DSLR, but there's no inherent reason why a mirrorless camera is better than a DSLR for, for, that, for astrophotography. It's just the trend in the photography market and the camera market right now. DSLRs that are being used are fairly old, but they're still really working well, as you can see in some of these photos. One thing that's important, though, is the sensor type. Every single one of the 50 images that's won Milky Way Photographer of the Year Award in the last two years has had a full frame sensor. So this is opposed to an APS-C or a, a crop sensor camera as they're called. Two straightforward reasons for this. Firstly, full frame sensors work better in low light. You don't get much more low light than the nighttime. Secondly, they allow you to capture a much wider expanse of the night sky as opposed to APS-C crop sensors, which literally crop it in. If using a 20 millimeter lens with a full frame camera, that's giving you the width of 20 millimeters. If you're using that with an APS-C camera, it literally crops it in by a factor of 1.5, effectively makes it about a 30 millimeter lens. So it's much narrower. The problem is that APS-C cameras are much cheaper than full frame cameras. You're talking at least a thousand dollars really for a for a new good full frame camera that ticks all the boxes. If your budget is limited, I always recommend getting a used full frame rather than a new APS-C. Not everybody listens, buying new stuff is more fun, let's be honest. So you can see the top five cameras used listed here on the screen. The Sony a7 III pretty much always comes up the top when I do analysis like this. I've also looked at the Astronomy Photography of the Year competition for the last six or seven years. It hits all the sweet spots in terms of the characteristics you want in a, in a camera for landscape astrophotography. It's also pretty affordable because it's, it's a few years old now. The a7 IV you can also see on the list is the latest iteration that has some improvements, but naturally more expensive. The Nikon Z6 and the Z6 II Great cameras as well. The Z6 II is the same sensor as the Z6, but it had some improvements in functionality. And lastly, the, the Canon EOS 6D is like the old classic workhorse of nightscape photography. It must be like 10, 15 years old now, at least. People are still getting amazing results from it, although they wouldn't be winning these awards. So, you know, why upgrade? The one thing that you can take from this other than having full frame is that you do not need to get the most expensive flagship camera. Too high resolution can actually be detrimental to your nightscape photography. It can degrade the low light performance to some degree. And also you run into problems with storage computer performance when you're dealing with those larger files because you're taking multiple pictures, long exposures, it becomes a hassle. The cameras in the list all have around 20 to 30 megapixel resolution. This is about the sweet spot whereby you can get the definition you need, but also not running into the problems we just talked about. One final thing to note about cameras is that the majority of the cameras used were Astro models. This is a process whereby a camera is manually modified by removing part of the sensor that would normally filter out certain aspects of the light. But doing this makes it better at capturing certain light and color from certain deep sky objects. So this is what you can see in these pink and reds in the skies in images like this. This is a fairly advanced step. It's not required for beginners, so don't think you need it to get going, but it's something you might want to think about in the future. Also, if you do modify a camera for Astro, it does degrade its use and performance for other regular photography. So it's only really recommended if you're having a second camera that's really dedicated for Astro.
There are two key characteristics of lenses for Milky Way photography. You want a short focal length or a wide focal length. Um, this means a low millimeter number. When it's shorter, it effectively captures a wider expanse. When it's narrow and longer, it's more zooming in, almost telescopic. But what you want for landscape astrophotography is that wide expanse, say 40 millimeter to 24 millimeter, often kind of the perfect spot. Second thing you really want is a fast aperture. So this is indicated by a low F number. Now, the lower this is, the faster it's light gathering performance. So F 1.4, F 1.8, great for premium lenses, up to sort of F 2.8 for more affordable options. And the top individual lens models used, you can see here with the Sony 40 millimeter F 1.8, being top, so it's hitting those perfect marks as you can see. Wide angle, fast aperture. Of course, it depends on your camera as to which lenses are compatible. But check the link below again if you want to see the full data set of all the lenses used. Now, star trackers. If you don't know, star trackers are devices that allow you to counteract the rotation of the Earth and stay focused on the Milky Way or whatever it is you're shooting. So you can take much longer exposures, gather more light and create a better image. Top star trackers used are on the screen now. You can see them. Skywatcher Star Adventure coming up top. Um, and the Move Shoot Move Nomad, probably the best budget option and lightweight option. Uh, star trackers can also be used for other types of astrophotography. In our course with Kayatana Size, she teaches how specifically to use the Move Shoot Move Nomad for shooting deep sky objects with your regular cameras and lenses. So the link below if you want to check that out. Lastly, tripods. There's no greatest tripod for Astro. From this data, everybody uses a different tripod. Um, the one thing you can take from it though is that every single tripod listed is carbon fiber. Carbon fiber, more expensive than the aluminum options, but better two ways really. One is better at absorbing any vibration that can come through the ground, either from your feet or from traffic or whatever. And secondly, lighter to carry. Uh, and that's pretty important because when you're taking shots like these, it's not going to be usually from your backyard unless you live somewhere spectacular. You're going to be walking out somewhere to get a great landscape that you're going to then capture the sky above. You can see the top brands listed on the screen here that we used in the data. One pro tip comes from Jao, who teaches our Star Trails course, is to get spiked feet on your tripod. So you can either buy them with this or you can add additional ones. That helps give it extra stability if you're shooting on grass or softer ground. He also has another cool tip about attaching cheap reflector strips to it, which makes it a bit more visible in the night, stops you from walking into it. And if you want the full data set, click on the link below and I'll email it over to you. This is not a particularly scientific study. It's just 50 photos, which is a small sample. They come courtesy of Capture the Atlas, who run the Milky Way Photographer of the Year competition. They are all amazing images from great astrophotographers who are delivering in 2025. So hopefully it's of interest to you. If you want to see all the photos, head over to Capture the Atlas. If you want all the data and findings from this in your inbox, click that link below, or else check out some of our courses or other videos.